Good afternoon. Welcome to day four of the Oval Chamber Business Fair. Um, we're nearly at the end of our amazing fair. We've still got five or six more events happening though, so please keep an eye on the website. You're joining us now to listen to Ben Malik, who is the Managing Director of Exilium HR Services in Yeovil, and um, we are going to be hearing from him about the power of HR. So I will pass over to Ben, who's going to present to us, and then there'll be a question and answer session at the end. Ben. Brilliant. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, as Joe says, I'm Ben Malik, uh, owner, founder of Auxilium HR Solutions. I have got some slides which I am going to share with you. So this is the technical bit. Can I make it work? He says, yes, that one. So you should now see my slides. So I'm going to talk to you um, about um, HR and how it should be supporting your business. Um, bit of focus for the session. I'm going to talk a bit about what it is. What is HR? What's its fundamental purpose? Uh, what does it do? So I'm going to share with you the employee life cycle, a bit about the current climate, and again, how HR really should be supporting your businesses through that um, and how perhaps they have been. Um, what you can do, some tips from me for your business and what Auxilium can do and how we can help you. Um, I plan to split my hour into probably two halves, so 30 minutes or so presentation. But for those of you who know me, know I can talk, so it'll probably be longer than that. But then the rest of the time, um, some Q&A. So if you have got any questions, please ask at the end. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, a, bit, a little bit about me. So as I say, owner of Auxilium HR Solutions. I um, also teach the IPD courses at Yoga College, exec member of Yoga Chamber of Commerce and a chartered member of the CIPD. So CIPD is the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. Um, and a bit about my past, I've had five years in consultancy, worked with some fantastic organisations, including Sky, Altran UK, um, YMCA, South Somerset Dist District Council, British Water and Taunton College, and many, many others. And before that was with Talis UK, Babcock International, and Ansbury, which are a charitable organisation. So in, in total, um, 15 years in an advisory capacity, leading projects, providing strategic direction to businesses, like yours. So what is it? What's it all about? Um, or what should it be? What should HR be? Well, in my view, HR should be the enabling function to drive your business forward um, and taking the people with it. And ultimately, HR ensures the business has the right number of people in the right place at the right time with the right skills, knowledge and experience, or that's the aim anyway. Um, and that those people are focused, motivated and appropriately rewarded to deliver the business its strategic objectives, because ultimately that is the purpose of it. So find balance, but important nonetheless, whatever size um, of business you, you own and run. And ultimately the fundamental purpose of HR is to enable the business to deliver against their strategic objectives. Um, what does it do? Well, here's my two minute explanation of, of HR and its, and its multi facets. And I, I'm gonna link to the employee life cycle to, to illustrate that really each element linked to the next and provides that all essential recipe to keep your employees growing and supporting the continuation and growth of your business and um, ultimately the elements are around attraction so finding people inducting them onboarding them getting them started developing and upskilling them um, performance maximization so getting the most out of them but engaging and motivating them to deliver make sure recognition is given um, where required and they're rewarded for a job well done and when it comes to it provide a smooth exit at the end um, and for me the key um, is, is, is has three elements to it um, and that is HR strong line management and leadership um, that for me is the recipe for a healthy business. And it's one of the reasons why I chose a triangle for my business logo. Because for me, the triangle represents the employee, the manager and HR working in collaboration and partnership to get the very best outcomes. And at the end of the day, HR done well, 
protects your business and your brand. So in a nutshell, HR is about feeding the business with the right people, maximise engagement and productivity, reduce employee turnover through job satisfaction, hopefully, um, develop potential, mitigate misunderstandings of communication, always communicating HR people, um, and develop a positive culture. Easy, right? Well, not always, but more about that in a second. Um, I want to touch on a little bit really about the current climate uh, and, and some of the challenges. And um, these uh, are not HR challenges, um, but they're business challenge and they're challenges that affect us all. And some of the things that I've been looking at for, for, for months now, as I'm sure all of you have, is what's happening in the economy, what's happening with unemployment rates, furlough, not furloughing, flexible working, home working, hybrid working, how is all that working? Um, and, and just thinking about skills and talent shortages and how they're impacting the business. And I've got a few stats and they are looking much more positive, which is good. Um, I looked at GD, GDP, um, 544, 1,733 million, that's a big number to say, in Q4 2019, a low of 426,197 million in Q2, and then a general positive trend through to very nearly 500,000 um, million in, um, in Q1 20. 21. So those are stats from, from the ONS. Um, unemployment rates, so we started 3.8 Q4 2019, higher 5.1 in Q4 2020. And the last figures were 4.8, and that was from Q1 of, of this year. So we're moving in the right direction, which is good. Um, furlough, almost 9 million people furloughed at its peak. Um, and the latest figures from March, um, that figure's halved, which again, is great, it, it feels positive. Um, cumulative claims of furlough to May 2021, 64 billion, massive number. Um, and again, that's from gov.uk. Um, interesting, I think it's interesting, um, the, this whole argument or, or, or focus on home working, flexible working, hybrid working, certainly been a massive shift over the last 12 months um, and again some stats from the office for national statistics on average 27 percent of workforce work from home in 2019 and that average increased to 27 percent uh, during 2020 and again latest figures from May 2021 show 26% working from home only solely working from home 50% uh, work-based, so office or work location-based, and 11 blended. I know that doesn't add up to 100, but those are the figures that, that have been published um, on ONS. Uh, and ultimately, looking at trends and, and people's perceptions of this, 85% are reporting of, of working adults reporting that they wanted that hybrid working pattern in the future. So some challenges for businesses and for HR to make all of that work. Um, so how does this all look for skills? Well, talent shortages are still there, Re regardless of unemployment rates, we're still struggling to, to recruit and, and find and retain talent in, in some key areas. Headliners are engineering, IT, health and medical and science. Um, and then, you know, data from, from gov.uk. So generally a positive picture which is good but all have implications for business and for HR because they all affect people. So what can you do? What can you do to improve HR and people management in your business? Well lots of things um, and here's my starting point. Um, if you haven't already absolutely fundamental that you have a contract of employment for all staff. How many businesses tell me that not all staff have contracts more than you would um, care to imagine still. Um, done on gentleman's agreement, it's all okay, it's all right, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is. It's fine while it's fine, but it's not when it's not. And um, it's very difficult to deal with it retrospectively. Um, so get it in, get it done. Set of policies and procedures. 
Um, minimum is discipline and grievance policy for a really small business, but reality is that employees expect employers to have something better than that these days. It's not very positive just to have the only policies you have in your business are discipline and grievance. You know, it, 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 it doesn't suffice. Um, but I think it's identify what your outline HR plan is, where you want to get to, and setting some short, mid and long term business goals and objectives and link that back to your HR plan. What people do you need to deliver those business objectives? That ultimately is my reason for existing is to make sure that the businesses I work with are set to to deliver on those goals and objectives. Um, and consider what internal resource you have. Um, most businesses have got some resource we can pull on to support some of this um, and implement your delivery plan and set some realistic milestones and review points. So that's, that's my starting point. But I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, and it's something that is going on currently for me. And, and it just really highlights the general misconception that probation dismissals are always risk free and not necessarily. So I wrote a little note to myself in terms of what the headliners was, because I wanted to make sure I've got this across. So we've got an employee employed for four weeks in the business. Um, we had a complaint from the client. We've had conduct issues reported from staff in the business multiple um, and general attitude to work is poor um, attention to details and the like so certainly grounds for having a stiff conversation with this employee i hope you'd all agree um, and and look at setting some parameters for for what their expectation is but the business knew that this employee had three protected characteristics so we knew that, the business knew that, um, but they went ahead and dismissed without going through any process, no documentation, no real discussion. Um, and guess what the result was? <laughs> Mastering Cloud, um, we don't have a right to um, appeal as employees um, with under two years service, certainly good practice too so one of the things i've put in place but we have had a subject access request um, for some information and we've had a acas um, early conciliation request so something that could have taken literally minutes or certainly a few hours to do is now going to take days weeks maybe months to sort out when we had a jolly good reason for dealing with it, but now struggle to demonstrate that objectively. So my top tips to avoid this kind of situation is whenever you're dealing with a new employee, get practice, right? Set some expectations out early on. Talk about the job description, the person specification, the, the, uh, the object of their roles. Set up some appropriate training and support. Provide them with some feedback on how they're doing give them that support to thrive. Um, it's cost a fortune to get to this point, especially if you've used an agent to secure them. More about that in a second. Um, but if things start to go wrong, we need to manage it. And managing it might just be sitting down and having a discussion, giving some feedback. I'm unaware of that. I didn't know that that's how I needed to do it. Okay, easy fix. Let's sort that out. Let's set something up. Let's have a review of performance, set some, um, objectives will restate the objectives and provide some time to improve and clearly we're going to come back around and revisit that again um, but most important um, all HR managers um, will go on and on and on about this but document the process and the discussion you've had why because that is our evidence that we've gone through some decent process um, we've treated people well uh, but ultimately, if after that formal review, we've gone through this this process, issues still remain, then that's a point where we've looked to part company potentially. But ultimately, th this simple process demonstrates that the employer's actions were appropriate and within what we call a reasonable band, band of responses, a band of reasonable responses, sorry. Um, and 
I, it'd be really difficult for me to share this with you, but I've got a a, a really good um, infographic. I don't know if that's come up, but there's an infographic from um, from Rec, uh, which um, just highlights some of the costs of um, of recruitment or getting it wrong. So if we go through this process and and we show somebody out. Um, without going through some decent process to try and fix it, potentially costs us an absolute fortune. Um, and generally, my view always in in all the years that I've been doing this job is that generally people don't come to work to do a bad job. Fact. Um, that is fact. So key focus. Um, HR enablers um, should be built, should be building strong employee motivation and engagement include some clear leadership, some sort of strategic plan, um, engagement and line management, um, being empowered, uh, employee voice, so opportunity to have two-way conversation in, in the organisation and some organisational integrity um, in a restating your company values and that being reflected in your culture. So some of the things I've mentioned already, but sharing your business story and why. And as some of the other speakers this week in the business fair have talked about why. Um, and it's so important, particularly when we're trying to pull people from um, it, from a difficult uh skills and talent pool and particularly locally for us in the west country why are they going to come and work for your business as opposed to the factory next door they're paying the same amount of money you know they're, they're similar similar type of role but what makes your business different um and and what can you use from that story to engage them and and make them want to come and also most importantly want to stay so that that is ultimately my top tip because that can be fed into your website uh, into your recruitment planning your advertisements everything and of course it links back uh, to the whole employee life cycle you're bringing them in and you're making them part of it which ultimately is is the best the best solution so a tiny bit about this I wouldn't be a very good consultant if there wasn't a tiny bit of sales in this but it's not a sales pitch but what can we do to help at Auxilium well um, meet the A team so the the Auxilium team uh, 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 these dusty crews we've got Simon we've got Julie uh, HR specialist Kimbo, HR specialist and Laura, um, recruiting specialist. And the fundamental thing that I believe wholeheartedly is that employing a dedicated HR professional does not have to be a luxury for an SME because we have tailored and attainable HR solutions that your business can afford. And my whole concept for for building my business is to bring um, some of the big business solutions that, that I have and I've learned over the years, but making them attainable for small businesses. Um, what do we do? Um, well, we make HR as a function. We move from reactive to proactive. We utilize technology. We reset and redesign processes. Um, we, we, we will um, rebuild reputation and brand, not seven brand, rebuild reputation and brand, drive change, and, and most importantly, deliver or help to deliver those business objectives for your people. Some of the services, help check strategic reviews, um, projects, technology solutions, so I can provide you, set up, implement, onboard HR and recruitment technology solutions at really reasonable costs. Um, do with some management development, retained ad hoc expert support solutions. But ultimately, Auxilium equals people problems solved. So that's everything I wanted to say. If anybody wants to have a conversation either as part of this um, live webinar um, or indeed if you're watching um, via YouTube, you can contact me direct. Happy to book a no obligation consultation or a chat um, with you, me or one of the A team. But any questions from any of you now, please? All right, let's leave that slide up. OK, let's not leave that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Let That's me all right. The power of questions. live events, hey? It is. There we go. Just like that. So <laughs> we'd leave that up so that people can take a minute to write that down for you, Ben. Um, 
so I think a lot of people perhaps will be thinking, okay, I'm a small business, I'm based in the Southwest. How sensible is it to employ my first employee as an employee? Or should I be looking at somebody who's self-employed and subcontract? Yeah, I get that asked, that question asked an awful lot. Um, I also am asking myself that question. Um, I think it's fine to use um, associates and go down the self-employed route, particularly um, where it genuine, genuinely is self-employment. And what I mean by that is if you have other people working with you, so Kim, for example, in my team um, and Laura, they both run their own businesses um, and they work for other clients. So if they work for me, they are coming in um, to provide me with their expertise in, in their field. Um, uh, or some additional capacity and then come away again. So I feel perfectly confident that in that situation, I can demonstrate that we've met the, the requirements for self-employment. But if, if, for example, you, Joe, had uh, an employee in your business and they only worked for you and they worked five days a week, every week, are they really self-employed if that is going on month in, month out? Um, for a long period of time and the chances are possibly not but um, the the things there are some tests um, and, uh, and and ultimately it's around um, control um, ability to substitute is is often a big factor in in identifying whether something really is self-employment so if your contract with your um, with your assistance if you like um, does have the ability to substitute when they're sick when they're not available or when a, additional capability or expertise is needed that's a good indicator um, of self-employment as is the control if the control is um, in their gift in terms of how and when the work is done that is also a good indicator but ultimately when you're starting out taking on somebody on the payroll is a is a huge commitment and so one way to tackle that if if it really isn't self-employment and you're sure of that is some kind of short hours contract and build it up um or, or perhaps even a zero hours arrangement where you are employing them, you will pay them uh, their holiday and, and any, any other statutory um, benefits that they're entitled to as a, as a worker or as an employee, but you keep control of the cost and, and you have that fluidity. And again, a contract of employment, you know, we can write that a solicitor can write that and you're really talking a few hundred pounds to do that and you've got that for many years and um, perhaps with a few tweaks and updates as you go along but that would be my advice and take some advice if you're entering into this take some advice and we say that a lot um, within our networking groups in chamber we're, we're surrounded by experts in in the locality and and all the businesses that are involved in yoga chamber of commerce and there is somebody who will work with you and support your business without it costing you the earth. Okay, thank you. So with a variable rate, small rate contracts or zero rate that you mentioned, mm -hmm. you also mentioned if they are employed on zero weight rate, zero hours contracts, you are still liable for pension, holiday, sick pay. Yep. How is that number written out? Because if you're on a part time contract, 28 days is the statutory minimum, I believe, with including bank holidays for a full-time employer, and then yeah. it's prorated. If you're truly on variable hours, how is it prorated? Is it prorated on intent or is it prorated on, say, the past three months or something like that? Yeah, so if it's zero, if it's zero hours, um, and that's how the contract is set up, um, then most employers will just add a, a percentage on top of that to, to count for the holiday um, if it's if it's a set number of hours so if it's eight hours a week for example then you would you would calculate 
all the allowances and entitlements based on those hours and then as that changes flex that um because obviously as we all know um the reference period is is it is set there now when people take holiday they, they should be paid appropriately for the hours they've done over the um the, that qualifying period which is now 52 weeks okay thank you any questions from anyone else at the moment um Thank you. Well, I just want to say thanks, Ben. I, I'll just step out for a couple of minutes with someone at the door. So I, I don't know if you've covered this, but is there um, is there common things that a lot of businesses is get get wrong? And, and, and in my experience, we our companies work with you um, for a while. And what I really love about your work is that you sort of set us up, put the stabilizers on, so we can we can do that. You know, it's it's, it's an area where you know we're a business of sort of 10, 10 people. We really needed a lot more help. Uh, yeah. One of the things that came across in discussing with you was the power of the handbook. I don't know if you touched that on a, on, on a slide where I might have missed and, and stuff, but yeah, can you talk a little bit about the handbook and maybe some common um, issues that we, we all face? Definitely, yeah. So one of one of my examples in terms of the storytelling is is the the misconception that all probationary dismissals are risk-free they're not necessarily um and and that you can do everything yourself well yeah you can um and and i'm a firm believer in you you will know this um all of you uh that my view i don't want to do the admin for you or, or make work for myself i i want to come in and be useful when you need me um and, and be that source of professional advice and give you the tools to go and do what you need to do in your business and then come away and come back when when we're focused on the next thing so policies and procedures are a really good way to give you um as managers as business owners as managers um as employees some guidance in terms of how to handle common things when they crop up which invariably they will so again you've always got a source of advice and guidance that you know is aligned to the legislation and some good practice that will uh, give you a starting point before you need to pick the phone up to me or somebody else for professional advice. So it's invaluable um, and the mark of a, of a professional business because you've invested in that. As I say, the minimum is, is the discipline and grievance, but what does that say about your business and your brand if that's the only policies that you have? And there's nothing about well-being. There's nothing about, um, you know, how you manage sickness or or attendance, uh, or you know, anything about the process and procedures around booking holiday. You know, all the things that we just take for granted. I can't think of any more from my head, but I mean, there's loads. Um, but a handbook can be. Um, can be small to start with and grow over a period of time. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a big bang approach. Um, but it, fundamentally important for all the reasons that I've I've set out. Yeah. Do you find a lot of businesses just don't have a handbook or, or it's something they overlook? It's certainly something that our eyes were open when, when, we, when we were speaking to you a few years back. Yes. Uh, yes, because it's a cost. I don't really want to pay for it. Do I need it? Um, so handbooks come out when something goes wrong and we put that in as a as a as a kind of closing the loop yeah. um, approach. So that, that's where they often come about. But clearly proactivity is best because it's about engagement. It's about support. It's about structure. It's about doing professional business. And as I said, it, it is um, it needn't cost the earth and and a lot of organisations, my my own included, um, can come up with a retainer package over 12 months where where you can factor in all of all of those sort of set up costs, if you like, and split the cost over over 12 months. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, thinking back to uh, kind of stuff that's happening in the current climate, furlough coming to an end. Um, maybe we'll see some redundancy restructuring again, uh, you know, a good handbook or have some um, some approach to how that's handled in the business again. So that mm. you've got a starting point for that um, employees know what to expect. 
as managers, we, we've got a bit of guidance around around that. So really, ultimately, it is the Bible, um, mm. and and it, it gives us that roadmap of how to conduct ourselves and and um, and manage situations well. Yeah, and just another point, and maybe you touched on this. I missed again, but um, HR systems uh, certainly has changed how we interact with our staff as well, uh, control it. Uh, it's been a real godsend actually. Is there a sweet spot from a size of um, company that would benefit from it or is there different systems and different sizes? Yeah, I, I believe every, every organization can benefit from systems, um, particularly now with software being provided as a service through web portals the cost has come down significantly um compared to you know a few years back 10 years back five years back things have moved significantly um i i use a product um called breathe breathe hr as a as a as an hr application specifically designed for small businesses and and i would put that in for anyone who's got any any employees ideally because it just takes away all of your admin sets you up for growth and um, you put in your systems and process you've got somewhere to put your contract your handbook your policies procedures processes forms all of that can be managed um, from that system so you don't need a SharePoint portal because it's all built into your HR system um, uh, and everything's in one place you've you've solved your GDPR issues yeah. and no paper it's all online and managed accordingly so for for 10 pounds or 11 pounds a month now I, I beg your pardon um, for 10 employee business um, it, it's really really affordable um, yeah. plus They've they've developed that that product a lot in in the last twelve to eighteen months. Um, there's some e-learning parts to it, um, rotoring and um, time recording element to it, and expenses and, yeah. and recruitment. But I have a a favoured recruitment product um, which I think is better, uh, but it integrates with Breathe, and and again that is very very cost effective for for small businesses because even if you do uh, even if you take the light version of it which which is where i suggest the small business that perhaps has up to 10 employees takes um i can manage all of the recruitment for you um but it can be branded as your business um, and it looks really professional and ultimately, I can give you access to um, to buying power to bring your cost of advertising space mm -hmm. right down compared to what you would get if you went direct to mm -hmm. CV library or total jobs or, or, or things like that. But, but because I'm buying uh, advertising space um, through through my partner organization in volume, we're, we're bringing that down to about a hundred pounds a, a job board which is which is really really competitive oh, that's interesting yeah an interesting white white white, uh, white label solution as they say yeah what are the we, we use breathe hr as you may as you may know um uh, and um without plugging them but those sort of systems one of the things that might seem really small but i, I thought was brilliant through covid was the kudos system yeah you know we, we are traditionally as a business quite bad at praising other people and stuff like that um due to you know various things and and, and now on our weekly sorry our, our monthly company catch-up you know whoever's leading it uh, leading that department will read out the kudos as who gave the kudos who to and why yeah. um and do you know what that's a really really good thing when we're all working from home and not under the same roof um you get that cross pollination of, of departmental things you know there's only 10 of us in the team but we are very separated in some of the things that we do that sort of system is brilliant at bringing people together actually from an hr point of view yeah uh, and, and that's a really good point because uh, many of my clients don't use that part of the system 
and and they don't see how it can fit into their business but that's a perfect way of how absolutely it fits and brings people together raises understanding and visibility about what's going on um where you're you're perhaps not co-located because i imagine um you're, you're probably not all back in the office yet no so how, how do you know otherwise unless you're emailing updates to people but you know it's one of the other 101 emails in your inbox that that day that week so it's, it's a great way to just pull it out and, and and make a you know make a celebration of, of that success or that milestone um which, which supports the whole cultural piece really so yeah a great great example and i'm pleased to be using it the other thing i will say to you um is that uh, anyone who wanted to use my services and they're already using breathe um either direct from breathe or through another partner and um, we can just switch that over um it's just about dealing with consent um and that could come over i can manage that for you mm. um whether it's direct with breathe or as i say another partner um very simple to do well, thanks, ben. thanks ben um you talked about culture um, and we've talked a lot about small and medium sized businesses. You've mentioned the up to 10 employees for certain different things, because there's a typical size business in this area. There's a lot of small businesses. I know you can deal and you do deal with some very big corporate businesses as well. So I know your services are scalable, but I want to take it all the way back to to the start. And I want to talk about family businesses, because a lot of people watching this are going to be part of a family business. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you a loaded question because I'm sure I know the answer already. And it's a two part question. And the one part, first part is if you're employing a family member or working with a family member in your business, should you have a contract of employment for, say, your spouse or your son, daughter, brother, whatever it happened, whoever it happens to be? And two, should that relationship, working relationship, hopefully fall by the wayside? and you need to terminate that employment of a family member, would Exilium HR be able to step in and manage that process that hopefully therefore preserving the personal relationship within a family? Yes. <laughs> yes, to all of that. Um, so should, should, should you have contracts? Yes, ideally. Um, is that the reality? No, it's not. Um, and like I said in my in my presentation, it's fine while it's fine, and it's not when it's not. Um, and and the contract is just about setting out those expectations. There is a difference between whether you're talking about um, other fellow directors who may not have a contract of employment, may not be operating under a contract of employment. Depends what they're doing. But if they are working in the business and they look and feel and sound like an employee, you probably should have a contract of employment, um, at least to set out the the, the, the basics um, and if if there are challenges later on then it's a good document to go back to um, to, to get things either back on track recover the situation or dissolve it um, and have I got involved with that yes many times over the years some high level and complex exits there's always a way um, it's always easier for me to have that conversation than the business owner or for me to have the conversation with the business owner um, because it diffuses it uh, um, my approach is um, quite matter of fact but calm um, those of you who know me and I find that uh, it, it, it is helpful to bring a third party in because I can hear what both sides have got to say and ultimately the, the solution comes out of that. Uh, but always, always exciting issues to get involved in those and never easy, but there's always a way. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. Any other questions from anyone else? No? Stunned into silence, Ben, and awed with the professionalism, obviously. So um, I would like to say thank you very much for taking the time to come and um, present and record this webinar and for putting all that information together in those stats and for answering our questions and the questions that were submitted previously. So um, 
one more presentation today. We have Catherine Merkin from Pardo's Solicitors talking about wills and LPAs, very important things these. So hopefully we will see you all again later. And then tomorrow we have three sessions again tomorrow. So hopefully we'll see you back again for the rest of the Able Chamber Business Fair. But for now, I would like to say thank you very much, Ben Malik from Auxilium HR. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, ben. Thanks, ben. Thanks, ben. Thanks, ben. Thanks, ben. Thanks, ben.